Take your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one. We're in this series called Numa, Discovering the Person of the Holy Spirit. We're at the halfway point of this series. And this morning we're talking about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I just want to uh, tell you that one week from tonight, everybody say one week from tonight, we have our encounter night. Everything in this series is pushing toward encounter night. It'll be at 5.30 p.m. next Sunday evening. We wanna invite you to come back and this will be an extended time of ministry. Now, we have a lot of materials that we can share with you that are on our homepage. So if you go to VeseliaFirst.com, you will see a link on there for the Holy Spirit Encounter Night and this Holy Spirit series. If you click on, click on that link, you will uh, see a frequently asked questions about the experience of the baptism of the Spirit that we're talking about this morning. You'll also see a little agenda or kind of a, a, pro, a program guide for our Encounter Night. For those of you that are really wanting to maximize your experience with God, we have given you a spiritual growth plan that's also contained within this document, of things that you can do between now and next Sunday night to best position and prepare yourself to receive from God. Uh, there's encouragement there about fasting, scripture reading, uh, some things that you need to be praying about, whether it's uh, repentance and cleansing in your life, praise and worship. It, it's, a, it's a God, a step-by-step -step God that will help position you for this particular night. I've done this previously in my ministry in times past, and I just want you to know that when we begin to prepare ourselves and position ourselves to receive from God, God always comes to meet with us in a powerful way. And so I, I really wanna encourage you, please, today, sometime bef before you go to bed tonight, go to our homepage and begin to download that material. Now, today's service may be a little bit different than other services you've ever experienced as it relates to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Typically, if you've grown up in a church like ours, uh, the end of the service would be an altar call and people would be ministering and praying for you to receive the baptism in the Spirit. But I just want you to know that's not what today's service is about. You say, well, well why not, Pastor? Well, we're, we're pushing toward the encounter night. That's what we're going to do at the encounter night. Because here's what I've found throughout the years. Uh, if you come to respond to a message like I'm about to preach, uh, you will feel time constraints. You'll be saying, oh man, the Rams are playing at 120. I gotta get home. I got a roast in the oven. I've got this, I've got that going on in my life. And your mind is everywhere else except for receiving from God. That's why we're setting aside this encounter night to set everything else aside to say, Lord, I've just come to receive from you. And so today I'm gonna to be sharing with you about the baptism of the Holy Spirit to hopefully stir up some spiritual hunger in you, to give you some more understanding about what it's about and what it can do to change and transform your life. I realize today that today's message may be like reading a hungry man a cookbook. You see what I'm saying? I, it may not satisfy the need momentarily, but it's stirring up hunger in you. How many have you ever gone to the grocery store while being hungry? Oh, big mistake. You better break out the credit card because everything looks good to you. You're buying stuff that you haven't eaten in years, stuff that you don't even like because you're so hungry. Well, today this message is about stirring up that hunger in you with a sense of anticipation and expectation of what God will do in us one week from tonight. As we begin to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and we'll be looking in Acts chapter one, verses four and five, I want you to see the importance of this message this morning. I think every age has had a particular sin, particular problem, a particular aspect of ignorance or rejection. In the Old Testament, it was the rejection of the Father. In the New Testament, it was the rejection of the Son. And in the modern age, it is the rejection of the Holy Spirit. There is something about the person of the Spirit, many times it's controversial, that provokes fear in us and anxiety in us, and it, it should not do that. The Holy Spirit is very much God himself. In the same way that we can trust Jesus and we can trust the Father, we can trust the Holy Spirit. And so we want an openness. We, we wanna receive from the Holy Spirit. It, I was 10 years old when I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and it transformed my life. From 10 years old until now, almost every day of my life, I've prayed in the Holy Spirit. I, I've wanted to stay true to God, close to Him, and this is what this experience is all about. So we need not be fearful, we should not be ignorant, we should not reject anything, good thing that God wants to bring to us, the Holy Spirit. So let's look today in the Scripture, Acts chapter one, verses four and five. Jesus is speaking just prior to His ascension. It says, in being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but notice this, 
You shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Father, this morning, I wanna thank you, Lord, for an openness to the Holy Spirit. I wanna thank you for spiritual hunger and thirst. I pray, God, that you would stir that and increase that inside of us because you've said in Matthew 5, 6 that those who hunger and thirst shall be filled. So, Lord, today, please reveal the Scripture to us, stir in us, move in us, help us, Lord, to contend and to break down barriers which keep us from all that you have for us to experience. And Lord, today we pray that you will begin to position our lives for a great breakthrough, an encounter with your spirit that will transform us. We ask this now in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. In this passage I just read to you from Acts chapter one, Jesus is speaking just prior to his ascension. His ascension is where he literally floats from earth, accompanied by angels, back to the presence of God. And just before he leaves, these are his closing words. This is the last thing that Jesus physically said while being on planet Earth. He begins to prophesy or to foretell about a coming experience that would be referred to as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This experience had already been prophesied hundreds of years previously. In Joel chapter two, verses 28 and 29, Joel said, but in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And also on the men's servants and the maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. So that prophecy of Joel, looking forward in time, occurred here in Acts chapter one and Acts chapter two. But it continues to be fulfilled as people are receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit today. God is still moving in the same way to fill his people with power. Let me say it to you this way. Some people say, well, well I'm, I'm saved. Don't I have the Holy Spirit in my life? Absolutely. The Holy Spirit comes to take up residence in you when you are saved. However, this second work, everybody say second work. This second work that God does in you causes an overflowing in your life. It creates an overflowing where the Spirit then becomes uh, operative in your life to quench the thirst of those around you. It is, a, it is a work of the Spirit by which power is given to your life for service, to be a witness, to walk in closer relationship with God, to possess a personal prayer language that creates intimacy in your walk with Jesus. We know that these words that Jesus spoke of and that Joel spoke of was fulfilled in Acts chapter two, verses one through four. That's the bedrock passage for us as Pentecostals around this experience. 120 people gathered in an upper room and it was there that they waited and they tarried. That word tarry means to empty yourselves. They emptied themselves over 10 days so that God could fill them. And when God fills them, there's the sound of a rushing mighty wind. There are, there are tongues of fire, this appearance of fire that appeared above the head of each person there and then they begin to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. You see, that's where it begins to get a little bit tense for people because they say, tongues, oh my goodness. You, you believe in speaking in tongues? Absolutely. I, again, I've prayed in the Spirit, I've prayed in tongues uh, the majority of my life, and it has kept me walking with Jesus uh, in an assured, peaceful, and confident way. God's Spirit is moving through us to pray to Him so that we may re remain connected with his heart. So next week, we're gonna be talking about the spirit and speaking in tongues. If you have any curiosity at all about this, I'm gonna be explaining it in detail, answering a lot of your questions. If you know people who are also curious about this, I encourage you to invite them to come as well because it'll be an informative time of understanding the power that God gives us through this experience. And this experience has been continually fulfilled in the lives of men and women throughout the centuries. Peter experienced it, Paul experienced it, there was a group of people down in LA, uh, ne near downtown LA today, uh, on a place called Azusa Street that was there where a great Pentecostal revival broke out that literally people from all over the world came to see and experience what was taking place in their lives. Not only did it happen for them, but it also happens for us today. And God wants to renew his work in our lives. So today we're gonna look at several aspects of the Holy Spirit and particularly this work that he does in our lives called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. If you're ready, say ready. This first point is the identification of the Holy Spirit. Write that down, identification of the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor Mark, we've already discussed the person of the Spirit. Well, why are we going over this again? Well, I'm gonna be sharing with you some different aspects of the Holy Spirit, but the reason I'm talking about the person of the Spirit again, identifying him again, is because we need a sense of trust about who we're dealing with. 
There is so much fear that builds up in people's heart when you begin talking about the Holy Spirit and tongues and spiritual gifts and miracles and all this stuff that sometimes we don't even understand fully the person that we're dealing with. And so I wanna begin to review a little bit since we're midway through the series about this person of the Spirit to build trust in this relationship because trust is the key to receiving from God. Our identification of a person provides great insight into the character and nature of that person. In effect, the actions and reactions of that person. And the word of God gives us this broad, wonderful picture, beautiful picture of who the Holy Spirit is and how he acts and reacts with us. So let's fill in several blanks this morning. First of all, we know that he is one third of the Trinity. He is one third of the Trinity. Again, God is one person distinctly identified in three. How can three people be one, one person? Uh, well, it's tough. It's a mystery of God. I'm not sure exactly how to, to express fully or explain fully all of those things, but we know this, that the Holy Spirit is just as much God as Jesus is. He is just as much God as God the Father is. And he has been with us from Genesis throughout Revelation. In Genesis chapter one, verse two, he is brooding, hovering over the, the work of creation. In Revelation 22, verse 17, he is there in the presence of God in heaven with all the believers for eternity. We know according to the scripture that he is the spirit of God and the spirit of Christ. So some of us who fear the Holy Spirit but trust Jesus, that makes no sense. Those of us that trust God but don't necessarily trust the Holy Spirit, that makes no sense because he is just as much God as God the Father and God the Son. Secondly, he is our comforter. In John 14, 16, we talked about this a little bit earlier in week one. He is the one who is called alongside of us. He is our strengthener, advisor, friend, counselor, advocate, helper, ally. This one who is walking with us is only walking with us to bless us. He is only walking with us to do the supernatural, the miraculous. He is only there to bless those who trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We find third that he is our guide. Look at John 16, verse 13. It says, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He does not speak of himself, but whatever he hears, that he will speak. He will show you things to come. It's better to have a guide on a journey when they know what's ahead better than you do. Am I talking to the right crowd this morning? If you've ever been on a trip and you have a guide, that guide is experienced. They know the way better than you do. That's why you have a guide. They know all the pitfalls. They know all the great things to see. They are the ones that will help to navigate you in this moment. And the Holy Spirit has come into our life to be our God, to guide us to the most preferable place of blessing that God has in store for us. He is there to show the way for us. He is the GPS in our lives. My only prayer is that you don't argue with him like I argue with my GPS. Let me just confess something to you. You know, the, 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 the GPS comes on with, you know, sometimes it's a female voice, sometimes it's a male voice, sometimes they have a British accent, which I have trouble arguing with a British for some reason, so I, I prefer putting the British voice on. And they're there and they say, turn left and turn right, or your destination is just up ahead. I, I will tell you that there have been many times I've argued with the GPS to, to go my own way, and about 99% of the time, they were right and I was wrong. If it wasn't bad enough, my wife was there to confirm. <laughs> my little helper was there to confirm that I should have listened to the GPS. But that's the way it is with the Lord. Sometimes God is trying to move and speak to us through the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is telling us to do things that seem counterintuitive to us. And therefore, we take back control and leadership of our life, and we call an audible when we do our own thing, and... 100% of the time, when you go against the GPS who is the Holy Spirit, you will be left disappointed. So the great key to our life is allowing the Holy Spirit to be our God. He's also our teacher. John 14, 26 says that he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatever I've said to you. So the teacher is there to instruct us in the ways of God to bring things back to our remembrance, to provide recall of the goodness of God in our lives. Sometimes our teacher has to teach us in the valley that God is still a God that can be trusted. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will bring recall to our lives in order for us to see the way more clearly. I can remember on one particular occasion of going through a very difficult, dark season in my life 
where the Holy Spirit spoke distinctly and directly to me and said, begin to think and to, to ponder upon the ways in which God has been faithful to you. And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, write those things down. Now, I'm, I'm not a, a much of a journaler, but I knew the Lord had spoken to me. And so I began to write down some events in my life where God had been faithful. And so I'm, I'm praying and I'm thinking in my mind, Lord, why is it that you want me to write these things down? And a voice spoke inside of me and says, because you forget. I think all of us have a tendency to forget. We forget how good God is. Therefore, our trust wanes, our faith is weakened. But God will bring to our remembrance those things in our life that we need to know. And the Holy Spirit is the one who does these things for us. We find next that he is our helper. Romans 8, 26 says, the spirit also helps in our infirmities and our weaknesses and our sicknesses and our times of trial. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So when it talks about him being our helper in infirmities, it means that he brings peace to us in times of chaos and trouble. Have you ever seen everybody around you losing their mind over something that's happening in your life, but God brought to you a sense of calm, a sense of peace? Everybody else is frantic. Everybody else is, is in, in chaos. Everybody else is seeming to panic, but for some reason you're not panicking. And you feel this overwhelming, abiding sense of peace that has swept over your heart. Who do you think did that? The Holy Spirit did that as your helper in order to bring peace to you in the middle of your storm. Again, it says that in this times, the Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Even when we're out of words, we don't know what to pray, we don't know what to say, we don't have wisdom to even know how to deal with the situations of our life practically. And all we can do is mutter and moan under our breath in times of prayer to God. He takes those moanings and groanings that are inside of us and he begins to express them as words of intercession, of prayer to the Father to say, God, that is your son, that is your daughter. Come to their aid, come to their help, come to their rescue. Finally, we see he is our transformer. I love this one, 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of God are changed, everybody say changed, into the same image from glory to glory, even as the spirit of the Lord. That word changed is the Greek word metamorphos, which from which we get our English word metamorphosis. It's been a long time for some of you since you've been in seventh grade science. But in seventh grade science, at least in my seventh grade science, they taught me about this scientific thing called metamorphosis. And they would show us back in those days, uh, just after the close of the Civil War, uh, that on a on an overhead projector, they would project this little cocoon of a caterpillar. And it's ugly, it's gross looking. I, I, when I was a youth pastor, I would talk more specifically about what it really looked like, but I, I can't do that in this audience. But it's gross looking and it's this little cocoon and all of a sudden it shows this progression where this process takes place called metamorphosis. And the caterpillar sheds the cocoon, it begins to sprout wings and this beautiful butterfly comes about by which it flies away. That's the same word that's being used here about our spiritual development as we partner with and are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is bringing about a metamorphosis in our lives. Some of us have some ugly past. Some of us have lived some ugly lives. Some of us bring our ugliness into our salvation. Sometimes it's hard for that ugliness to get off of us so that we can be the person that God really wants us to be. But God says, I will change you by the Spirit of God. I will create a metamorphosis in you. I will take you from something that is ugly, that the world despises, that, that you despise yourself when you look in the mirror, and I will change you into something beautiful. I will take you from something that is, is bound in a cocoon wrapped up and something that is confined to a butterfly that flies away. I will give you wings to fly. I will give you a future ahead of you that you've never dreamed before. God is all about transforming our lives. Secondly, this morning, we will look at the operation of the Holy Spirit. The first thing we looked at was the identification. Now the operation of the Holy Spirit. How does he work? What does he do? What does he do in our lives? There's a lot of different directions that we could take you this morning, but there's one aspect which best describes the operation of the Holy Spirit, and that is power. Everybody say power. power. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, but you'll receive power 
after the Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. Again, connect those dots. If you're someone who writes in your Bible, circle power and circle witnesses and draw a line in between them. I will give you power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. That word power is the Greek word dunamis from which we get our English word dynamite. Dynamite, dynamic, miraculous. Let me say something to you. The Holy Spirit is is at all times supernatural, but rarely spectacular. Now, that that should bring some comfort to some of you because you see this experience in Acts chapter two where God is bringing raw power into the lives of 120 people. And there's a sound of a rushing wind and there's tongues of fire and that's pretty spectacular. Uh, What I wanna say to you is that God is always supernatural, but rarely spectacular. Sometimes we get scared of the spectacular And we begin to think that somehow if we don't experience it that way, that we're maybe not receiving the same thing that people in the Bible did. No, friends, I will tell you, God remains supernatural without having the obligation of being spectacular. And so with that today, we we need to take comfort and refuge that God will come to meet with you in the way that you can receive. But he will come to you with dynamite, explosive power, miraculous power, supernatural abilities, The working of the Spirit is always accompanied by dynamic supernatural power. And the more we rely upon the Spirit's power instead of our own, the greater the demonstration. Paul, at one time in his ministry, was up on Mars Hill, this place near Athens, and he's trying to appeal to these philosophers, very intellectual guys, and he's trying to talk to them. They they believed in all these foreign gods, and he talked about the unknown God and all of these things. But Paul made these words. He came to to realize that it wasn't in his wisdom or his eloquence or his philosophy and appealing to people that made the difference. He became to realize it was the work of the Spirit through him that convinced people and changed lives. He said, I no longer come to you with the eloquence of man's wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and with, say it with me, power. Friends, I will tell you, I've done everything in my, can, in, my, in my life that I can to educate myself to be the best and most informed pastor I can possibly be, but there's nothing of my words that can change your life. But I believe that there is power that comes to the person of the Holy Spirit that can literally break the chains of bondage which wrap about your life. I don't care what you've been bound to, whether it's anger or fear or crack or cocaine or alcohol or whatever the case may be, God has power to come and to move into our lives that has nothing to do with the philosophies or the education of our mind, but the experience of our heart to do something supernatural in our lives. And today we need it. Would you say amen? Let's give the Lord a hand. Peter and John, they experience this transference of power. They're fresh out of the upper room. They're fresh out of an encounter night, so to speak. They're going to the temple as they always did. Acts chapter three, and they encounter this beggar. We've seen folks like this right in our town. Uh, Folks uh, that are homeless in Visalia, folks that have very little. As they're walking by there, this homeless person reaches up to them and says, uh, can, can I have an offering? Is there something you can give me? In that moment, they said, silver and gold, we don't have, but what we do have, we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. They take the man by the hand. The Bible says that power begins to flow through that man, through his bones, down to his ankles, and this man begins to walk, to leap, to shout, and to praise the Lord. I, I wonder what could happen fresh off our encounter night next Sunday if some of you walked into the workplace and you came about a cubicle or you came onto an assembly line or you were out there in the field somewhere working and there was someone there that says, hey, I need to talk to you. I just went to the doctor last week and they diagnosed me with incurable cancer that in that moment you could take them by the hand, that you could pray the prayer of faith and in that moment, God healed that person by his mighty power. You say, pastor, I I can't do it. It's, It's just me. God knows who I am. No, no, my friend, it's not about you. It's about the power of the person, the spirit that's operating through you in that moment to bring about a demonstration of power that is supernatural. Jesus gave great emphasis to this power. In his own ministry, he would not enter into the ministry, though he was the sinless son of God until he he was anointed by the spirit, empowered by the spirit. The apostles, he said, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until you're endued, literally means clothed with power from on high. You stay there until the Spirit covers you. You remain there, you wait, you tarry, you empty yourselves until I come to fill you. 
And if we're gonna be a follower or a disciple of Christ, then we need to be clothed with the Spirit's power in our life as well. So the one thing that really defines the work of the Spirit, the operation of the Spirit is power. There's one aspect of this power that I wanna share with you that's my favorite, which I think is the most profound, and that is the aspect of fire. Please understand today that the Holy Spirit is not fire, but behaves like fire. In other places in Scripture, they talked about the Holy Spirit as water, as rivers of living water. He's not water, but he behaves like water. And in this aspect of behaving like fire, there's some powerful implications to our lives. Matthew 3.11 says, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, fire. We see this confirmation in Acts 2.3 with the appearance of these, these tongues of fire that appear above their heads. Because the work of the spiritual fire is to consume, to purify, and refine. Listen, friends, when we go out of this place and we go into the world, there are all kinds of impurities we're always getting on us. There's all kinds of temptations that are there before us. There are times in which we take the bait, we fall short, we sin, we stumble, we fall. But when we come back before God, and I believe when we pray in the Spirit, there is a refining and a purifying to our life that God brings to us. There is a fire of the Spirit that consumes everything that's not of Him. I can't tell you how many times I've gone before God and said, God, I need your refiner's fire to burn out of me everything that's not of you. Take away those things that are displeasing to you. In the Old Testament, Isaiah referred to the Holy Spirit as the spirit of burning. In Isaiah 4.4, when the Lord will have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. Now, if you've ever been burned, that's not exactly a pleasant experience. But sometimes there is a burning that is needed to make us more like Jesus. There is a refining that needs to take place to make us more like the Lord. And this burning, this refining will also fire us for service. Again, from the book of Isaiah chapter six, Isaiah comes before the Lord. He hears a voice, who will go for me? Who shall I send? Isaiah says, I will go for you. Here I am, Lord, send me. And before the Lord sent him, before the Lord sent him out, an angel takes a, a coal of fire from the altar. This is in a vision and places it upon the lips of Isaiah. And in that moment, he is purified. Because before that, he says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips. And the Lord says, I've got an answer for that. I will refine you with the spirit of burning, the spirit of fire to make you what you ought to be. Let me say to you, I am a man of unclean lips. You are a person of unclean lips and we live among people who have unclean lips. But there is a work of the spirit by which he brings his fire into our lives that purifies us, refines us and makes us what we ought to be. Again, talking about the fruit of the spirit last week, it's not by your willpower, but by his power and the power that he brings is fire into our lives to make us more like him. So we've seen the identification, the operation of the Spirit, but now let's talk about the qualifications to receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When we begin to think about qualifications, we, we actually begin to believe that we gotta be perfect to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. If that's the case, none of us would ever receive. I, I wanna tell you a story about how a, a person in my church in Georgia received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on an encounter night. We had gone through our little program and in this program, I give my own personal detailed testimony of how God baptized me in the spirit. And then we do a little question and answers. And then after that, we have some snacks out in the commons and those that wanna come back in and receive prayer can come back and receive prayer. And those that don't, they can, they can leave. They can just exit at that point. No shame, uh, no condemnation. We want people to be ready. We want them to trust the Lord for the right time to receive in their life. And so after the break, about 100 people had come back in the room. That night, 63 people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 63 out of 100. But the, one of the first person I prayed for was a, uh, a guy in my church named Maurice. And Maurice is a fantastic guy. Painter, uh, in his 70s. Uh, he is a man's man. Yeah, but you know, he, he, he's a sweet guy, maybe a little rough around the edges. And 
And so he's praying up here, leaning against the platform. His wife is at the altar just bawling and squalling. And I just said, uh, Maurice, I said, I wanna pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He said, oh, Pastor, I'm just so unworthy. I can't, I just, I don't think God could do this in my life. And I said, oh, Maurice, listen, this isn't this is about your worthiness. I said, are you open? Oh yeah, I'm open. Are you hungry? Yes, I'm hungry. I said, well, then when I lay my hands on you and pray for you, uh, the Spirit's gonna stir in you. You may feel like this bubbling up on the inside. And I just wanna give you permission to speak out of your mouth a language that you've never spoken before. He looks at me with big eyes. And, well, Pastor, what are you saying to me? I said, no, 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 just, just trust me in this. So I lay hands, I pray for him. And I mean, instantly he begins to pray in this prayer language. And so I go from there. And the next person I see is Kathy, his wife. Now, Kath, Kathy, she is Miss Churchgoer. Maurice, <laughs> he's a little rough on the edges. Some of your marriages are like this too. But Kathy is an angel. Kathy walks with Jesus. She's over there crying, squalling. I said, Kathy, stand up. She said, okay. I said, listen, I'm gonna pray for you that God will baptize the Holy Spirit. She said, pastor, I, he can't. I've been, I've been seeking God for 40 years for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I have prayed, I fasted. I said, Kathy, it doesn't matter. I said, God's gonna fill you with the Spirit. And I said, and I'm gonna ask somebody that you know real well to come and pray for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She said, who? I said, Maurice. She said, Maurice? <laughs> she said, Maurice received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? I said, yes, just about, about 90 seconds ago. She said, I don't believe it. <laughs> God baptized Maurice in the Spirit before he baptized me? I said, Kathy, don't get offended. I said, I'm gonna ask Maurice to come over here. He's just praying in the spirit right now. And I'm gonna ask him to lay hands on you. When he lays hands on you, you're gonna receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. She's like, okay. <laughs> you know, lifts her hands. Maurice walks over there and said, Maurice, lay your hands on Kathy's head. He does. I said, just pray in the spirit. He begins to pray in tongues and immediately Kathy's baptized in the Holy Spirit. I say all that to you because all of us have a little Maurice in us. We don't feel worthy. We're rough around the edges in some ways. We, we're kind of closed off. We don't know everything about it, but there's something in us that really wants to connect with God and God honors that. And then God uses that in order to bless other people with this experience. So here's the qualifications to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. First of all, you gotta be saved. You gotta be saved. You gotta know Jesus. Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, the taking away of sins, the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So salvation happens before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 20, verse 22, Jesus has, has been resurrected. His disciples are in hiding. They're hiding away in this, this safe house, so to speak. And we know that Jesus appears to them like a ghost. He, he, he literally appears through a wall and steps there in the middle of them and Thomas comes in front of him and says, hey, feel the, the, the spear in my side, the wounds in my hands to prove to you that it's me. He does that. After Thomas does that, the Bible says that Jesus breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. How many of you believe that they received the Holy Spirit? Okay, I do too. But there were no tongues. I believe that was a picture of salvation where the Spirit comes to enter our life. He takes up residence in us. Because in the same conversation, Jesus says, but now guys, I breathed on you, you've received the Spirit, but I want you to go to Jerusalem not many days from now, and I want you to wait there, and you're gonna receive the promise of my Father, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna do another work in you after this one. My Spirit's living in you, but now I'm gonna do another work in you not many days from now, and there you're going to encounter the power of God where God's power clothes you from on high. So we know that this happens before we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So what do we do in this salvation experience to, to receive this second work of grace and, of, from God in our lives? Well, I think you gotta be willing, listen to me, to be willing to turn away from anything that displeases God. That doesn't mean that you've conquered it. That doesn't mean that you're victorious over it, but you gotta be willing. You gotta have a desire in you to say, I don't want this in my life anymore. And I believe, God, that by your power that you will give me through the Holy Spirit, you will take your fire and burn that out of me. So that hang up that you've got in your life is not keeping you from receiving anything from God. It may be the position of your heart. And if the position of your heart says, Lord, I wanna live better than this. I wanna live victorious over this. God will honor your desire. Next, we gotta desire, desire to be filled. Write that down. We must desire to be filled. Matthew 5, 6, they that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. You don't have to understand it. You just have to want it. 
The believers in the upper room, they said, you gotta go there and you've got to wait for the promise of the Father, full stop. No description, no preview, nothing that God said, yeah, there'll be wind and fire and tongues and all this stuff. No, no, they didn't know what they were waiting on. They just knew that God told them to go and wait, that Jesus had given them specific instructions to go and to wait. And so they're waiting there and they didn't understand what was happening. Yet when God touched them with power, there was something that created a convincing evidence inside their heart that they knew this is what Jesus had spoken of. In fact, it says that when they went out of the upper room, there was a crowd gathered around them and they thought these people were drunk with wine. And Peter says, we're not drunk with wine as you suppose, but we've been filled with the Holy Spirit and with power. That crowd didn't understand it either, but on that particular day, God baptizes 3,000 people ushers them in the kingdom of God, fills them with his spirit. You don't have to understand it. You just have to be willing to receive it. Then finally, believe that God through Jesus will fill you. Mark eleven twenty four. 24, therefore I say to you, what so things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. What I want you to know today is that God's a gift giver. He loves to give gifts to his children. And in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, it says, if you then Though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So here's what I'm gonna close today. Marco, you can come and join me on the keys. How many would say that though you love Jesus and you're doing your best to walk with him, please don't raise your hand. You would say inside yourself, there's something more. I'm desiring more in my life. Though I walk with Jesus and I know he's real, I know I'm on my way to heaven, there's something more I want God to do in my life. There is, I wanna know him in a greater dimension. I wanna know him in a greater intimacy. Beyond that, I wanna do things for him that I feel powerless to do now. My friends, that comes to you through the experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, where God comes to give you a personal prayer language that knits your heart to his and empowers you for a life of victory like you've never known before. I believe that God's gonna do that for many of you one week from tonight. And today I'm believing and trusting that God will stir up spiritual hunger in you. Father, today I love you and I praise you and I thank you. Lord, for your word that paints a picture that creates hunger and thirst and desire in us to know more of you, to be more like you, Lord, to do more for you. And Lord, this aspect of more is fulfilled through the work of the spirit that comes to baptize us. So Lord, I'm praying for that spiritual hunger to arise. But Lord, I'm also praying for people today who are lost without you. That today they are sensing a drawing, a drawing in their heart. Lord, almost like a power of magnetism, their life is being drawn to you. And they know, Lord, there are things in their life that are wrong and they know they need forgiveness. And today, Lord, will be a day of liberation and freedom and forgiveness and cleansing in their life as they accept you as Lord and Savior. So Father, today, do what we can in these closing moments in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Heaven said, Pastor, I know you're talking about this spiritual experience, but I, I'm here today, I'm lost like God. I've come looking for answers. And I, I sense there's something more that God wants from my life. I know that my life's in sin. I know that I'm lost without Him, that I'm distant in my relationship with God. Maybe you've never come to know Him or prayed to receive Him, and you're just sensing something in your life where today's my day. I need to commit my life to Jesus and be a follower of the Lord. If that's you and God's dealing with you, would you just lift your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me, that's me. I, I'm not right with God, but I wanna be today. Yes, ma'am, thank you. Bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Looking up, yeah, I see up at the top, thank you. I see at the top, thank you. Right here on my left, yeah, God bless you guys, thank you. Right there together, bless you guys. Over here to the, my far left, yes, I see several of you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you, bless you. Would you pray this prayer out loud with me? Everybody, everybody pray it loud and strong. Would you pray with it? Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus who died for me. Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life. Forgive me of my sin. Take away all my many failures, my mistakes, my shortcomings, my guilt my shame. Touch my life today. Make me more like you. And I will live for you. 
all my days. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand this morning.